so, uh, you know, Martin Luther posts his 95 theses on the castle door of the Wittenberg, you know, Wittenberg, and he's got, he's mad. And what's he mad about? Well, he's mad because they're trying to pay off the debt on St. Peter's. And by the way, I'm glad the Roman Catholic Church built St. Peter's. It is a beautiful place. If you haven't been, you ought to go. But it cost a lot of money, and that still does when you build buildings. I bet you figured that out. So it cost a lot of money. They had a lot of debt. And the debt, you know, debt, hiring money, getting money for debt is hard. They figured that out. And so they came up with this little jingle uh, and a campaign to try to pay off the debt for St. Peter's. And uh, they even, you know, and, and they came up with this theory of indulgences. That is, if you give some money to the capital campaign to pay off the debt at St. Peter's, then it will reduce or free a loved one from some of the years in purgatory. So they even had a little campaign slogan, as soon as a copper into the kettle clings, a soul from purgatory springs. It was very clever, probably had a brochure. Anyway, uh, it sent Martin Luther over the edge. It was the final straw. So when you read his 95 theses, a lot of them are complaining about a capital campaign. Well, here I am in the capital campaign business, among other forms of generosity, cultivation, and I'm, I'm sobered to remember, okay, it can be done wrong. I, I get it. It can be done wrong. Uh, but it can also be done right. Uh, the Bible's actually full of great generosity moments that were sweeping through the people that were done right. I mean, just a couple of them come to mind. One is the people of Israel are out in 400 years as Bedouin slaves freed from Egypt by the strong arm of God, and they're out in the middle of this. They're not to the promised land yet, and God says to Moses, let's take up an offering. Let's build ourselves a tabernacle that we can pick up and move. And you'd think that that group of ex-slaves wouldn't have two shekels to rub together because everybody is, if they've got anything, they, they're holding it in the back corner of the tent. Uh, but uh, they do. They begin to just give because they're aware of the God who brought them out. I mean, they were still very much aware how they owed everything to God. As Mother Teresa says, you'll never know God's all you, all you need until God's all you got. And that's where they were. But uh, then they just began to give. Some people had some purple cloth, and other people knew how to sew purple cloth, and some people had some gold. Other people knew how to hammer gold. And the point is, they ended up with jewels and gold and purple cloth and all kinds. They made a beautiful tabernacle, which served them for centuries, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of it all, and they raised all that. And, and the people just got so caught up in it, they gave with such a generous heart out of gratitude to God, so much so that Moses finally had to say, stop, stop bringing the money which is the last time that sermon was ever preached. But the point is it got to, it was just so much. The people just were caught up in the joy of it. And talk about timing. I mean, there are people who think that you ought to wait and time the market or when there's no war in overseas or whatever. Uh, most of the great generosity moments in the scripture happen at the worst possible time. Another was when they were raising the money for what would be called Solomon's temple. And the guy who gave the big money, who didn't want named after him, curiously enough, the guy who gave the biggest gift was King David toward the end of his life. He's been the glorious king for 40 years. Now there's a lot of uncertainty because everybody knows David is on his last breath here. So there's a lot of political uncertainty. What's going to happen now? He's got a lot of kids. What's going to happen? Uh, and at the end of his life, the last thing he does, he feels led to let's start raising the money for a temple that I will not worship in. Uh, but I, but I, but any any gives a, a gift only a king could have given. Uh, for since of course for Chronicles, he gives a gift only a king could have given. And, but it's not a, even for him it's a big gift. It's a lifetime of savings, and it tells the gift and of the shekel what it was. And then he says, "Who's with me? Give yourselves to the God to the Lord." And the leaders come forward, uh, leaders of tribes, captains of industry, etc., uh, and they give. And the people were so overwhelmed watching their leaders and their generous hearts that they then turned off and then they gave what they could give. Uh, and then it broke out in worship. And that's really the pattern of a good capital campaign. There are some people who can give a king's gift and they need to. Uh, and their leaders who may not be able to give that gift, but they're leaders and they're the ones that people respect. Leaders lead. And when people see that, it sparks a movement, and then they can join if they can join in the same spirit, even if not the same dollars, and it breaks out into worship. Well, that's done right. See, in the early church in Acts chapter 4, i got to stop here, but there's a lot of movements like this that happen at difficult political economic times, but maybe that's exactly the right setting, is God just simply moves heart to heart. How can we develop a culture in a church that develops that kind of spirit? And it doesn't have to be a capital campaign, be annual giving, all kinds of things. In fact, the three legs of the stewardship stool, I think you want to develop, 
is one is your annual giving. It's measured by budget giving, whether you have a pledge campaign or whatever. Because the point is, as with any relationship with your spouse or anybody else, you've got to you've got to maintain this annually. That's where it really that's where the water hits the wheel, and that's an important part of just discipleship. And it's worthy to talk about it. I mean, every year you ought to go to the an annual physical because things change. Well, we ought to have a spiritual check in as well, and one of them relates to what's God doing financially. So. Uh, we even having an opportunity for people to think about this once a year is not because we need to meet the budget. It's because we want to give them another time to check in with God. Uh, anyway, so one leg of the stool is how are you doing annual giving in a way that is fresh and invigorating and invites and engages new families, et cetera. Uh, second leg of the stool is this occasional opportunity for a kind of a sprint in the middle of a marathon where you need a surge of giving. This is what a capital campaign would be to pay off the debt, to add a new wing, to go multi-site, whatever, you know, whatever you're doing. And then the third leg of the stool is plan giving or legacy giving. What is the gift that perhaps I could only give at my last breath? And should not that gift have some uh, correlation with the way I gave during the rest of my life? What would it be like if someone who tithed all their life, what would it be like if they tithed their estate? One last will and testament to their heirs, doesn't cut their heirs out, but it is one more time to say to them how much faith their faith means to them, even if 90% of it went to the kids. And even someone of a very modest, the average net worth in America is $1.3 million. Now, most of that's your main 401k in your house. You can't give that on your annual campaign gift. But at your last breath, you could give a six-figure gift to a Christian cause. Uh, and it almost never happens in the Christian church because we're not doing any teaching around it. Hospitals and colleges are doing a lot of teaching around it, and ethically and honorably so, I need to say. Now, the church needs to learn some language there, but I think that's another leg of the stool we're often not doing very well uh, to, to help put those kind of gifts in place. So finding ways to, to do that in an ongoing way is part of our mission with any church. If you have a capital campaign, it's, in my mind, it's just a teachable moment. It's another teachable moment that might call a person to another trajectory-altering kind of level in their life, and you want to try to get them to get to there. What are the kind of things that a church can do to try to cultivate that? Well, let me just give you a couple of quick ideas around that. Uh, one is try to use language that is uh, giver-centric rather than church-centric, whether you're whether it's an annual report or an appeal from at the offering time. Uh, by the way, use your offering times. What nonprofit wouldn't love to have their constituency in front of them 52 times a year? And I know the church doesn't have the same people 52 times, but we get them a whole lot more than the alumni of a private school. We've got an opportunity, not another sermon, but a little teachable moment. could be two minutes uh, that we often waste in the, in the offering moment. And whether you're taking up money in the offering or not, if they were giving online, just a moment in worship liturgically that teaches, just a little moment you can have. But what we want to think of what's giver-centric. So for instance, even our annual campaign stuff, if you look at it, a lot of it is we need to do this for First Church. Our elders are developing a budget. We need you to fill this out because this is how this is what keeps the lights on. It's all basically about we need you to do this because it serves the church. Uh, and younger generations are bouncing off of that because they're not they're not institutionally loyal. Doesn't mean they're not generous. It's just that this do this for the church. Uh, you, what about if instead we approached it and said, we want to give you a way to have an exercise at home that we think will be a blessing and a gift for you. And one aspect of that is for you to say, here's what I think God wants us to do in terms of undergirding and engaging with what our church is doing in the world. But, you know, it's more what we want for you again, not from you. Uh, you want to be able to, I think it's important that you be able to, to mine your data. This would be a great thing for us to argue about probably in our Q and A here, you know, who should know who gives what, uh, when I was a pastor, uh, which, you know, was back when the new Testament, was just freshly written. The ink was just hadn't even dried yet. So it's been a while ago, but, when I was a pastor, I in, in two of the three churches I served, I did not know what people gave. They didn't want me to know what they gave, and I was happy about that. We all thought that that made me more virtuous, and some probably thought they didn't want our righteous pastor getting his hands filthy in this, you know, look this uh, ungodly money. I don't know. Uh, maybe they thought that it would make me more pure. Maybe I thought it would keep me above reproach that I ran to the hospital quicker for the top 10 givers. Anyway, we all just agreed keep, that keep me out of it. Uh, well, here's the problem with that, because here, uh, brothers and sisters, I have changed my mind. Uh, now what we're doing is now you've got a pastor who's in charge of discipleship in the life of the church, who's absolutely flying the plane blind. Uh, one of the, if Jesus is right, and I bet the farm he's right, 
uh, how a person is related to money is a key indicator, one of them, not the only one, but a key indicator of what might be going on in their heart and spirit before God. Why would you blind the person who's trying to mature a church to that key indicator? It'd be like going to your physician for an annual physical and say, look, I need an annual physical, but we're not going to do cholesterol. I don't want you to do any blood work. I don't want you listening to my heart. You can't get a good annual physical. You're blinding that doctor to all that she needs in order to do the physical. Same thing spiritually. Uh, I think most pastors worth his or her salt are not going to favor the wealthy. If anything, I think in the church, we're neglecting the wealthy. We don't have, we tend, we, and as we should, we rush to those who are in financial difficulty. We have Ramsey courses, et cetera, help people do, but we tend to have very little ministry to those who are in surplus situations and they're getting their information then from the Wall Street Journal or from some nonprofit. Why don't, you know, that? so anyway, uh, risk, take the risk that the preacher's going to know, but here's the deal. There's a difference between a culture of confidentiality. I don't think everybody's giving these to be posted in the website. A culture of confidentiality is correct, but a culture of secrecy, that's another thing. And if those who have pastoral and leadership reasons are not allowed to see one of these key indicators of what God might be doing in a person's heart, well, here's what that means. For one thing, it might mean that you put people in key places in leadership who have no maturity at all in their giving. If you're not screening that, then you have the wrong people in the wrong seat of the bus, to quote, to quote Jim Collins. I found out in one church I pastored that of our 10 pastors, two of them were giving zero when I finally found this out. Both of these could be coached around. One was in financial trouble. The other one was angry because he spent all that time up at the church and they all got money, so I'm just giving my time. Uh, these were issues that we needed to know about. If you've got a discipleship pastor who's in charge of small groups and he or she's giving nothing, and then you try to say, let's do some small group work around giving, guess what? They're not going to be very excited about it. So you just can't have key lead. The more to the core of a church you are as a key lay leader or key staff people, the more arc out that you influence. You can't have people in the very center of the church who are not obedient in this level. It doesn't mean you they turn in their 1040 and make sure it's a tithe. I don't mean, but you don't have to be legalistic, but you can at least see if there's anything close to some kind of obedience there. But in addition to just knowing, here's what knowing allows you to do. If, uh, let's say that three quick things. What about if you had, when there was a new gift, if a pastor was just alerted, hey, Alan and Connie have just given a gift for the first time. Maybe I've been in the church a while and we're dropping $5 bills in, but now for the first time I've given online or a check or something. Now I'm a record. But well, instead of just somebody in the ad board, you know, putting, make a new entry in the software, what if you, if you triggered and said this month, these are the people who gave a new gift. What about if a pastor could just write a little handwritten note and say, Alan and Connie, I've not been seeing you at the church a while, but I understand you you gave a gift this week. And I just want to tell you how much that means, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. You know, you know why we don't get second gifts? Because of how we handle first gifts. You get crickets. You give money to St. Jude's. I tell you, give $10 to St. Jude's. They will cover you up and thank you, thank you. And here's what your gift did. Uh, and you, the, the church used to get a pass on all this. We just, we didn't have to cultivate giving. We didn't have to be grateful. We didn't have to, you know, uh, friends now and in the future, we don't get a pass. Uh, people have been too well trained about what care for givers feels like when they gave to their college. You're sitting in Belmont right there. You better believe Belmont does a better job than that. So uh, so how we get second gifts may relate to this isn't about just getting money for the church. This is caring for people. If someone gives for the first time, something happened. That's a trigger. Let's tend that moment. Let's say someone's giving a thousand dollars a month. Another report to be great to have is a, a huge variance in giving. So I'm giving a thousand dollars a month. And in one month, I give 10. <laughs> Uh-oh. Sure, way to tell if that's him or us. Yeah, I think it are all your other apps closed? Well, and I would like to take this moment to thank those who give the protocol of that. <laughs> Double check. Let's give him a second. As you can tell, Alan's very passionate about this, very articulate when it comes to talking about this. And we, we certainly will get him back 
as far as questions go. Let me take this moment while we're getting Alan back to invite you, if you have questions, to go ahead and be writing those down. Um, Nick and Bill and John can circulate and grab those and bring them up to me. I've got some questions to kind of prime the pump a little bit. Um, so I'll also say from my own experience as a pastor, um, we went through this, we went through that shift that Alan is talking about. Um, the last church that I pastored um, had had some people of means there. And, um, you know, it wasn't, I wouldn't call us a, only a white collar church by any stretch of the imagination, but they'd had this very deeply embedded culture of secrecy. This is not something that we talk about. And yet those same people, just as Alan was talking about, were used to getting appeals from the hospital and the, and the university. And they wanted their church to aspire to do significant things for God. And so for us to be able to do that meant we had to grapple with the question of how money was going to make that possible. And for us to do that meant we had to talk about a, what a culture of generosity would look like. I'll tell you from my experience, it's, that's a that's a conversation that doesn't that shouldn't happen quickly, but should be happening in your congregation. And so part of what that meant for us was we, uh, with our leadership team, we started talking about it. Um, we started saying, we started asking, we, I started off by asking questions. What do we want our capacity as a church to be like in, in terms of, um, in terms of our, um, what we're trying to accomplish and how did we think about money and how did we talk about money? How did that play into it? And I didn't direct that conversation. I facilitated that conversation. So if you're a pastor and your church is grappling with that, for you to come in strong probably is not the, the, the best way to get at it, at least for my kind of my practical advice. On the other hand, inviting people to think about it is a good thing. So are we back? We're back. Oh, sorry. Don't know. It's Your technology. Demons, demons so. in the wires. Hey, let me just sum up quickly because I know our time is uh, about there. So, uh, you know, uh, variance in giving, give, giving a chance to say uh, thank you for, for that gift. And I wonder if there's a that because, friends, there's a story every time. Hearing that story privately. So most of this is just private pastoral care. By the way, if someone's giving a thousand a month and goes three months giving zero, many times our giving is a foreshadow to our activity and uh, we could rescue some people who are headed out the back door if we could just keep up better. So if we got to get past the secrecy part because take... Mm. All right. If you have questions, go ahead and go ahead and be go ahead and be writing those out and and sending those up, and we'll we'll certainly work to get Alan back. So, as let me let me kind of go ahead and finish with my story, and I apologize for the kind of back and forth nature of this in some ways, but for us, part of what that meant as a congregation is um, we we started asking the question: What would it look like? Exactly as Alan talked about, what would it look like for us to be equipped with this information, and how could we use it in ways to that enable that enabled our church to to better um, be involved in kingdom business? And so, little by little, there was a group of lay leaders that kind of caught the vision for that. And we're talking about that. And they were the ones making the decisions on what do we want that culture to look like? What are the components that would go along with that? We began to take very seriously this notion of saying thank you to people for giving. Um, when, you have, when you have a culture of secrecy um, and nobody saying thank you, then that doesn't, um, that doesn't recognize the generosity that's playing itself out in the, in the culture of your congregation. So we put some safeguards in place to make certain that um, that that information wasn't circulating. Um, but I, the the finished product of that, the end result of that, was we had a significant moment of spiritual renewal in the life of our church. We went through a not a capital campaign, but a stewardship campaign um, called Immeasurably More. 
And not only did we increase the total amount that was given in our church, more important for us, we incre increased the total number of givers in our church. It's one thing to be thinking about giving, and, I, and I, will, I will confess as a pastor, a lot of the time I would be thinking about the bottom line, how much is coming in. What Alan's talking about is not just thinking about the bottom line, but thinking primarily through the lens of all of the individuals in your church and how their giving is an aspect of their discipleship. So for us, that's what our goals were. Our goals as a congregation were to challenge ourselves to be involved in God's work. And then we got to sit back and see what that looked like in our congregation. Um, I don't think this is the most important thing, but what it enables us to do in 2015 is raise our budget 15% in one year. And for us, that was we're with a church with a $2.5 million budget. That was that was significant. I mean, we got to do a lot of things that we wanted to do. Most of the that surplus that came in on top of that, we we pushed out into the community. Yeah. And then the church saw that. Yeah. And they recognized that their giving wasn't, you know, it wasn't just keeping the lights on, it was actually making an impact in people's lives. And so that 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 wave that we kind of created in some ways, we kind of were able to surf that for several years running as that kind of, we created a virtuous cycle in some ways. So hold on, Allison, Alan's texting me. Um, maybe he said, should we try to do Q and A by speaker phone? Um, all right, let's, let's, let's give that a shot. Still, you can zoom up so that it can Yeah. Oh, here comes Alan on zoom. Hey, now we got you back. Yeah, don't right. and and what I did is gave a little testimonial, Alan, talking about some of the things that you talked about in terms of how do you kind of create yeah. a culture of generosity. Let me ask this question while I'm waiting for your questions to come in. So if you have questions, hand them to Bill or hand them to John or hand them to Nick. I think I've got a few maybe. So um, what I was talking about, Alan, in the break was um, kind of taking this notion of a culture of generosity. So, mm -hmm. so much of what Alan's talking about is not just, okay, we're going to share information. It's, it's how do you, in your congregation, um, create a culture in which everybody in your church sees this as a part of what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ, and it's part of the congregational culture. Right. So... Let me ask a really practical question, Alan. If they're trying, if in their congregations, if they are trying to take a step in that direction, what are one or two or three very practical mm -hmm. first steps that they ought to take to start creating a culture of generosity in their church? Yeah, one of them, if it's possible to sort of establish that we want to become a generous church and generous people because we serve a generous God, if you could make that language just the overall, it gives us permission to be talking about this instead of just two weeks in October, uh, say this is one, we want to be a prayerful church and a missional church and a friendly church, you know, but if you're thinking about your core values, identify that, this is something we want to be. Uh, another thing is, uh, I do think the offering moments is an important thing to take advantage of. It's more than just whoever can pray, you know, uh, and again, it's not another sermonette, but it's a chance to connect the dots for people. How's your giving changing lives, yours and others, uh, try, because that's a fairly frequent thing. Think of the kind of things that help are how do you teach? What kind of teaching happens throughout the year? Not just because we're doing an offering coming after that. In fact, you might have the teaching series in the spring if your annual giving emphasis is in the fall. So they separate a little bit because you're because you're teaching because the teaching is good and right, not because we're behind on budget. What kind of teaching? What kind of thanking? We talked about thanking some before. Some thanking is public. Some thanking is private. Uh, thanking people. Uh, you want to report to people, connect the dots, reporting to them, could be the offering moment, could be a, a quarterly report back to them about giving, not just a sterile, here's what you gave, does it match your checkbook record, but rather your giving allowed this to happen in the world. Here's an update about what our church is able to see and to do, and here's what's before us. So reporting and then celebrating. And what can you celebrate? So much of our talk in the church about is about what's coming up. We almost never look back and say, you know, we talked about that marriage and rich retreat for two months. Here's what happened. You think of it like driving a car. 80% of it is looking out the front windshield, but you do have to occasionally check those mirrors to see what's behind you on the side of you as well. What about if about 15 or 20% of your church communication was looking back and celebrating what God has done? Uh, so if somebody gives a gift, an endowment gift, celebrate that. Talk about that. Not only did it happen, 
but talk about what you're going to do with it because it'll help somebody else think, oh, that could be something. We've been meaning to do that. So those kinds of things will probably help build that culture, uh, but mainly just uh, get to where you're not afraid for this to be ordinary language. It isn't two weeks we've just got to plow through in October and then we'll go quiet again. It's almost like hush money. If we keep the budget up, preacher, will you just not mention it? No, uh, we're going to talk about this because Jesus talked about it. And it's about life. It's about giving uh, the, the heart its checks to connect with God. So I think those are the things that, that will make a difference. Sometimes it is the meat and potatoes of a sermon. Here's a sermon that's very clearly about generosity. Again, maybe not at the time we were taking up something. Uh, and sometimes it's more of a drip hose, you know, instead of a fire hose. It's just a single phrase, a single illustration. A single word. So it's okay to sprinkle. It's not like you're talking about money year round. I don't mean that. There are times when it's much more salt and pepper than meat and potatoes, but just don't let it be confined to these two weeks and then we're going to get over it. Because what that does is it says we're embarrassed about this. Similarly, don't say to adopt, if we really believe giving is joyous, then don't say at the offering time. Now, if, if you're visiting today, this isn't for you. you know, we don't, you know, get past that. If we think this is good, say we, we want all of us to do this. Don't be afraid to teach new members as you're orienting them that this is what we do here. Don't be afraid of driving them off. They're trying to figure out what is it like to be a member of this church. From the very beginning, say, we want to be a generous church. We serve a generous God. Here's what our people do. Make that normative, not superlative, that someone gave. That needs to be normal. If it's not that way, that ought to alarm us like a child who can't walk at four years old. So uh, those kinds of things, let it be normal instead of unusual without any sense of apology. But again, it's driven by not what I want from you. It's what I want for you. If that'll become sure in your own heart, you'll come across the right way. So uh, I'm going to start asking some of the questions that, yeah. that come from the folks that are here this morning. So how the this question is, how do you adjust the way that you talk about this when your congregation is rich in talent and time, but less so in financial resources? Does that mm -hmm. make any impact in how you approach this? I don't think so, because you're still talking about generosity with all the currencies God gives us. Time is probably more precious to us than anything. So you, you want to celebrate and encourage people to be generous, but just, you, you know, we talk about time and talent, but don't be afraid of money as well. So it's never just money, but it's also not without money as well. But, and even, you know, people, you, you want to call people before a generous and loving God who actually knows our story. Uh, and the Bible is really full of people who we wouldn't have dared ask for any money who gave in ways that that uh, made angels weep. You think of the widow's might, a little boy with some loaves and fishes, whatever, uh, a widow who takes care of Elisha. So uh, it's not because I because I don't have very much that we'd say, well, we're not going to do this at all. Uh, it is too much of a joy for anybody at whatever level to find some way to be a part of what God's doing. But I think we you'd be sensitive to that. I think you would. Uh, but you, I wouldn't back off and say that this isn't part of our thing. Time is enough because everybody still has something that's flowing through their hands. There's a reason we want to teach children and youth. You're not balancing the budget on piggy banks, but you want to start this as part of the teaching for the all of the life of the church with whatever is flowing through my hands what does it mean to be faithful to God about this? And it, candidly, uh, every statistic says the more money one gets, the less percentage of it one gives. The gravitational pull again, the most generous people probably in your church are those who may not be highly resourced, but they're just mature. Uh, God bless them. And, and, and those people should be on the finance committee. And then who gives the most money? It's who gives the greatest maturity. So uh, one person asked a question about setting financial goals, and it's an interesting question. If we are setting financial goals, are we limiting our potential? Mm. Well, I do think when you're casting vision about whatever you're trying to do, it's, people give to compelling vision. I, I, I'm reluctant to put too many dollars on it, but if you're saying, uh, you know, we uh, our annual giving, we hope that our annual budget next year can be 10% more, but mainly you want to talk about why. Here's what that would mean. Here's the opportunity. People, people don't give to need. You know, we need this. It makes them say, what's wrong with the church? Maybe things aren't going all that well. Who's managing this thing? Instead, let it be, here's an opportunity we have. Let's be a part of this. Uh, but maybe, yeah, you have to have a number on it. If we can, if, if we can increase our giving by 10%, it allows us to do this. I, I think that's all right. Because you can say, and if and how much more might God have in mind? I always leave it open in <laughs> on the other side of it. But uh, I, you know, I do think that uh, sometimes it helps for people to have a sense of what are we, what are we trying to aim for here? That's probably okay. 
So uh, we, we talked about this a little bit during the technical difficulties, but I'd love for you to keep going on it. How to begin the conversation of transitioning from not knowing to knowing who gives. So again, yeah. like practical steps in that yeah. direction. Yeah. So sometimes there are things that are written down. It's in the church bylaws and constitution. Nobody can know except for the finance administrator and that person can't be a member of the church, that kind of thing. So it's a whole lot more to pull up those stakes. Many times it's just oral you know, just the way we've always done things. Uh, but this certainly has to be done with a leadership group of people. And it takes some real Bible study and history study. I don't mean to become a, have someone from Belmont history come by, but get set some context because we just start from an assumption that that this will probably lead us in a bad way. I, I work from the assumption that what are we missing because of this and try to you know, and, and, you know, try not to get it where someone thinks that, again, now suddenly the preacher's pouring over all the money or or whatever. By the way, some of the people who may be pushing back about this are the ones who really don't want the preacher to know about their giving. So you probably need to anticipate maybe some pushback. But I think you'd have to have some leadership conversation around that. Uh, there's actually some pretty good material out there, white papers and things about, you know, should, uh, uh, you know, should a, a pastor know about the giving? There's a number of things I could point you to. There's a book called Contagious Generosity by Jim Shepard and Chris Willard has a whole chapter on that. There's some things to read to expand your thinking on it beyond what we've said here. But I try to engage some key leaders who care about financial things, but spiritual things to see, do we need to rethink that? And and, and I mean, do you want to think of it as turning the dial? Maybe you can't go all the way where you want to go, but so don't, don't lose everything because they wouldn't go all the way. Maybe it's just saying, uh, could we at least begin to uh, be aware of people who've dropped out in their giving and have some way to respond to that. I mean, who's walking out the back door here? Uh, could we, how can we thank better than we are? To, you know, so just take what you can and keep moving it that way. So they realize that, okay, we're still being a church here. I, I, I'd probably start, but you had, it takes some leadership conversation. No question about that. So you, you talked a little bit about the generational shift in the way that different generations are thinking about the giving that they do to the church, through the church, yeah. Now flesh that out for us a little bit yeah. more. I'm really not in as much despair about younger generations as some of my uh, my peers are. I think the younger generations, Y, X, Z, I think they'll be very, many times they don't have much money, but they have time and they're far, actually more generous with their time. They'll give up their vacation and go on a mission trip to Haiti a whole lot quicker than my generation would. We'd, write, we'd written a check, but we wouldn't give up a Saturday morning. So they're actually very generous with that level of currency, many more, I think more so than their previous generation. Uh, but we still really have to nurture them about money because the myth that a lot of people have is I'll become more generous as I get either older or wealthier. And the statistics don't bear that out. As we get older, we just become more encrusted in the way we already are. And as we get wealthy, as I say, we actually hold on to it even more unless there's a trajectory altering experience, which the church can offer spiritual breakthroughs, opportunities that are teachable. But you want to start, you'll never learn to give a million if you don't learn to give one. I mean, so we have to still start when things are, you still got student loans and you still got a baby in diapers and all that. You have to still start there. If there's one alarm, it is that my parents' generation were tithing when they just had a dollar. They didn't wait until they had $100,000. And that is less true today. We really are kind of giving ourselves a pass on, well, I've still got student loans, or I don't even know how long I'm going to be here. And we really have to, we got for their sake, they're not going to get any different when they're 40. For their sake, we've got to try to help them find their ways to connect. But language around what's giver-centric rather than church-centric will certainly make a difference Celebrating all the forms of generosity, but not leaving money out of that. Helping people see how even the smallest amount is important. There's no, if it's a big gift for you, it's a big gift for God. Uh, so thinking about what what is a sacrificial gift, giving in a way again, not that it hurts, but where you give up something for that you like for something that you love. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to do this later when the kids go to college. They're going to stop eating out or buying a car as quick because they've got some, car, <laughs> some college loans to do. Uh, anytime you're, you're doing, any, even if you're dieting or trying to work out, you give up something you like for a little bit because there's something even more you love. What if they could fall in love with what the church is of doing that changes lives? Younger generations are very much enamored by, is anybody's life being changed? They don't much care about, are the light bills on and did HR costs go up? But tell the story about how the church is changing lives, and they'll they want to be a part of that, it, both financially and they'll do it with their time as well. Any other last last call for questions? 
Matt, how about a question in terms of for folks who are not giving at all to expect a tithe is probably unrealistic. Mm. Uh, thoughts on is it is it a good strategy to say let's begin at some level even if we're not yet at ten percent? Get that, Alan. Yeah, I did. Great question. Yeah, I mean, here's the, the statistics are that in the average church, established church, not a brand new church, but the average established church has forty percent, almost half of their active membership who give zero, 40%. We're not talking about someone on the roll we haven't seen in 12 years, someone who shows up at least you know, during the last year, 40%. So there's a lot of people who are at zero uh, and they're not going to go from zero to 10% most likely. I think that's exactly right. I think you can, I, I wouldn't recommend being legalistic about the tithe, nor would I throw it out, which is kind of the way Jesus took it. Uh, it's still a pretty good teachable model because it's enough money that you feel it and it makes you be a better steward of the rest of it. Uh, so that's still a pretty good model. And if you're not there, not a bad one to work toward, uh, but at least give, begin to give something and honor that and bless that. Maybe work instead of giving an amount, think of giving a percentage. That'd be another step forward. Some people have been given the same thousand dollars. It used to be a tithe and now it's one percent. So it, you, know, you get leveled off. By the way, it's one of the dangers of online giving. I'm a big fan of online giving. But one of the problems with online giving is you don't check in again. It just happens automatically. So with, even with online giving, really encourage them to check in before you reestablish this year's online amount. But anyway, uh, but and, and then if the other thing is a tithe isn't a ceiling any more than it's a floor. There's a lot of people who never occurred to them there was anything beyond a tithe. The New Testament doesn't throw the tithe out, but it talks about grace giving, which not only can be gracious below the tithe, but also moves beyond. There's some people, highly, more highly resourced people, who've learned to live on a reverse tithe. They give 90%. That are retired long ago, but they keep working because they can give, do even more for God's work and they live on 10%. Anyway, but I found one church, I coached one church actually, I stole it from them, so I'm now passing it to you. Uh, they had on their annual pledge card, they did an annual pledge card for their annual giving. Uh, and instead of just the amount I'm going to give this year, and is it more or less than last year, they, they've said it, maybe growing and giving doesn't just mean giving more money, it means growing in how I think about the money. And so they gave a way for the person to self-identify on the card that they turned in, this represents a first-time gift, or this represents a first time I filled out one of these cards. This represents the first time I'm going to be intentional with a, with, with a you know, planned, I'm going to give the, uh, an amount. Uh, this represents going to a percentage for the first time. This represents a tithe of our income. This represents more than a tithe. And so there were these five boxes. They were all indicating an effect. Robert Sears has a thing called the steward, the uh, giving ladder. They represented rungs of a ladder of what a maturing believer might be like. So it isn't just a dollar amount. It's what did that dollar amount mean? How do you come up with that? What is, you know? And they encourage people to say, is this a year to maybe take a rung up the ladder? Well, when they, when they celebrated it, they didn't just, they celebrated in the big font, every one of those. Yay, we had 47 people who gave for the very first time. I mean, balloon, confetti, that's fabulous. And we had 13 people who are for the first time giving a consistent amount, not just when they show up or when they feel like it. And we had 15 people who are giving, a, uh, they're going to move toward the tithe. And we had 47 people who gave a tithe. And we had eight people who gave beyond a tithe. They celebrated every one of them with huge joy and then kind of in smaller font. And the dollars added up to this. And what that said was, we're really trying to grow believers. It isn't just how we get the money that the church is based on. I thought that was a pretty good model. And then they kept up with it year by year. Is this a year we moved on, took another step? Maybe too much of an answer, but I think it's a good thought. If, if all they hear is the starting point is 10%, then it may be I'm out. And that's probably not smart. We need to have a, a softer on-ramp than that. Can we say, even with all the technical difficulties, it was worth it? So thank you, Alan. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you very much, Matt. All of you friends, so grateful that you're in that room. And I got to be a part of it uh, occasionally in and out. <laughs> Thankful for that. Yeah, it was thank really really wonderful. And thanks for your time. We very much appreciate it. So we're going to take about a 10 minute break. And so you can go, you can do the restroom if you need to do that. Uh, thanks again, Alan, for your wonderful time. And then in a little bit, we'll introduce Paul Greer to you. So let's take a break. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Like introduce our speaker. Uh, Paul Greer is vice president of the Presbyterian Foundation. Um, he has worked at the Presbyterian Foundation since 2003 in a previous life. 
He worked in healthcare, was a volunteer at the Presbyterian Foundation, and for some reason they decided to bring him on at the foundation. Um, Just bad judgment. Uh, Paul is a good friend of mine. He is also an informal advisor to the Center for Healthy Churches and, and helps us in a variety of ways. So we're very grateful for his friendship and his wisdom and his insight. Um, he does a lot of nuts and bolts work with church. The Presbyterian Foundation is the largest Protestant foundation in the world. And they work with, obviously, given the name, a lot of Presbyterian churches. But the Presbyterian Foundation is um, in, a, in, a, in an era of challenge for the American church. The Presbyterian Foundation is one of the leading um, organizations to try to help churches ask really good questions about how they're going to respond in very nuts and bolts ways. We envision Alan as kind of a 25,000 foot level down and Paul from the ground level up and hopefully they would meet in the middle and overlap a little bit. So uh, Paul will flesh that out for us in, a, uh, in just a moment. Um, so we, wanted, we want you to do just like you did last time, though. We want this to be interactive, and Paul's going to give you a little bit more direction about how he wants that to work. But we don't just want you to sit passively and listen. We want this to help you in your congregation, in your context. We have a lot of different churches in Project Thrive, and none of the churches are the same. So your needs and your questions are particular, and so we, it'll help us help you if you would voice those questions so that we can give you very specific answers to what you're dealing with as a congregation. So that'll be part of what we do this morning. So let's welcome Paul Greer. Thank you, Matt. It is great to be in Nashville. It's great to be with you. I was going to freeze for a moment so you would you know, think that we were on Zoom, but I'm incapable of doing that. This, this is a fascinating gathering. To have people from different Protestant, Protestant traditions in the same room talking about money on a Saturday morning just makes my heart sing. <laughs> And I am not surprised that there are more non-Presbyterians here than there are Presbyterians here because that's life being a Presbyterian. We always say, we, we usually say this about Alabama, you know, Alabama's got more Baptists than people. <laughs> and, and when you're a Presbyterian, you're accustomed to being in the minority. Now friends, I'm going to point out something that you probably know, but I'm going to go ahead and verbalize it. Everybody that has been on this platform and on this screen so far today went to seminary. I did not. So you're going to hear a financial person's perspective on money and faith and how they intersect. So when I say things that sound really, really corporate and commercial, that's the world I come from. But friends, that's the world that most of your members have come from. So we're going to do a little bit of translation. So, images of inspired giving. What does it mean to inspire your members, your visitors, your attendees, your worshipers, to begin giving? And then to begin giving generously. If you ever hear yourself saying, we just need to educate the congregation about our needs, go ahead and slap yourself in the head right then. You do not need to educate your congregation. You need to motivate. You need to inspire. You do not need to educate, but you do need to inform. So, uh, Alan used the term paucity. I've always used the term scarcity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change some slides when I get home to Greenville, South Carolina, because I like paucity better than scarcity. You, you've heard it all before, a culture of generosity versus a culture of scarcity. Friends, we Americans 
obsess about scarcity. And you've probably noticed that some of your most um, well-resourced members can sometimes be the tightest. Sometimes they worry more. But that's a natural human instinct. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about different generations of people in a minute and, and some, of the, some of the characteristics of how those people think and feel and act. And, and close as I can tell, we've got a good three generations worth of people in this room right now. But some of us don't act like our generation. Some of us act like a different generation regardless of our age. Mm -hmm. I have been told many times that I am at my core just a crotchety old guy. <laughs> and I heard that when I was in my 30s. <laughs> and Mike Carter, who is a very successful businessman and friend of mine, told me once, that he had been a grumpy old man in training all of his life. So sometimes we can't look at a date of birth and figure out where folks are coming from. Sometimes we have to go a little bit deeper in the ways that we think about money and the ways that we feel about money and the ways that we talk about money. Apparently there's some class in seminary that says that a discussion of money is necessarily uncomfortable. Well, friends, in an MBA curriculum, they teach a different story. They teach the story of, of money is basically all you talk about. I happen to believe that money is a tool for mission. Just like a PowerPoint, just like a speaker, just like a wonderful building, those are all tools for mission. They're tools for ministry. Money just happens to be really, really fungible. You can exchange it easily. I doubt if the pastor here wants to carve out a few bricks and go down to Staples to buy office supplies. I'm not sure Staples would be too crazy about that either. So, so we're going to give some thought to how do we think, how do we talk, how do we feel about money. We're also going to talk about the image that you create. For those of you that are clergy, one of your core strengths is that you are effective storytellers. But I would argue it's not enough to tell the story. You also have to show the story. How many of the clergy in here have looked out in their congregations and seen someone with their eyes closed? Okay, don't go there. That's not what I'm talking about. Matt gets that a lot. But sometimes we have to close our eyes to create an image ourselves. And while, full disclosure, I am not a screen in the church kind of guy. I like holding the hymn book. But what I have discovered when I visit in churches where there are screens is like, wow, I'm hearing and I'm seeing all at the same time. Maybe the Baptists knew what they were doing when they started introducing this stuff. The Presbyterians are just a little slow to catch up. So we talk about the image that we create, an image of generosity, an image of how money can be used as a tool. So let's talk about images for a minute, and let's talk about how we inform and, and how, we, how we inspire, how we share a message with these images. And so, let's see if this is in the right order. No, no, we're not quite there yet. Um, as, as we use these images, we, we depend on data. We depend on information about the people in our church and the people that are not yet part of our church but who we would love to invite to be in our church. We know that these images cannot be instantaneous and then gone. 
we know that the communication has to be multimodal. People hear it, hear it, see it, feel it. We know that these images have to be intentionally redundant. A stewardship campaign that is not intentionally redundant very rarely succeeds. So here's a question. What is the most recognized brand on the planet? Anybody? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is the single most recognized brand on the planet Earth. And those silly people at Coca-Cola continue to advertise. <laughs> we all know what they make. Some of us are old enough to remember the mid-80s when they came out with new Coke. And it was a disaster. <laughs> But we have to keep telling the story. There is research that says you have to hear something seven times before you actually retain it. With our children, we think it is biblical. We think it is 70 times seven. <laughs> before people actually retain what we're telling them. So if the pastor talks about a need in the church one time through only one medium, maybe from the lectern, to assume that everybody's going to get it, remember it, and act on it is probably little more than unbounded optimism. And, and so we look at the data, we look at the information, we look at how do we translate. I was a CFO of a healthcare company. I never sat for the CPA exam. Partly because I knew I wouldn't pass it, and partly because I had a trustee who said, Paul, you're a really good financial storyteller. We can hire CPAs all day long that don't know how to communicate. What we need is somebody that can translate financial statements for a board of trustees. Well, friends, you are the translators of the church's needs into what your audiences need to hear. And so, data. Data, information. And you can only have that if you understand the community that you're in. Not, not only the worshiping community, but now, are we still in the Green Hills area here? West me. West me. Yeah. Okay. Green Hills is that way, I guess. Yes. The terrible thing about GPS is you never know where you're going. <laughs> you just know how to get to where you're going. So it's important to know the community landscape. It's also important to know the philanthropic landscape. So I realized a little bit too late that it's hard to see yellow from a distance. You've got the same information on the last page of your handouts. And we're only gonna spend about 10 seconds on this. Philanthropy is studied a lot. Philanthropy is big business. And what these illustrations show is, where does the money come from and where does it go? Everybody wants to meet Bill Gates to ask Bill Gates Foundation for money. Yeah, sure. That's not where the money really comes from. The money really comes from people sitting around a kitchen table talking about what they care about. Families having discussions about philanthropy, about values. That's where money comes from. And you'll see here that two-thirds of all giving, this is 2021, we don't have 2022 data yet, two-thirds of all giving comes from families. Now you see foundations is 19%, but that's misleading because that includes family foundations. Y'all familiar with family foundations? There's a bucket of money. It's almost always controlled by a small group of people who are related to each other. And guess what? They sit around those same kitchen tables. So the best estimate is that individual giving is actually about 77% when you take into account family foundations. Why does this matter? It matters to reinforce that who you're talking to, it's people. It's not nameless, faceless foundations that operate out there in the distance. It's the people in your pews. It's 
sometimes the people on the other end of a Zoom screen. That's your source of giving. So as we look at the totality of how folks give, good news and bad news, religion is number one. We are 27% of all charitable gifts. That's the good news. We are the plurality recipient of American charitable giving. The bad news is 25 years ago, we were at 50%. Mm -hmm. So does that mean the church is doing a terrible job? Or does it mean, what's number two? Obviously, education. Does it mean that the folks in education simply do a more consistent and a better job of asking for money? Mm -hmm. So here's a little trick. It has worked about 275 times in a row. So whoever I call on, don't, don't mess it up. Okay. The young lady in the gray sweater, right there. You, mm -hmm. tell me your name. Adrian. Aaron. Adrian. Oh, sorry, Adrian. Adrian, Adrian where did you go to college? Uh, the University of Texas in Austin. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that the giggle, or is that the other people? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I always get them confused. Aaron, would you be willing to share with us? Adrian. <laughs> okay, so I got this going wrong. Anyway, maybe I should call him somebody else. <laughs> Is there an Aaron in the room? <laughs> Adrian, how long ago did you begin your experience at that fine university? 2009. 2009, so that's 14 years ago, right? How long ago has it been since you had your feet on the campus? Year. A year. How long has it been since that fine university offered you an opportunity to make a gift? I've been a very thorough job of making sure they don't have my contact. <laughs> 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 275 in one. <laughs> yeah. not, not super recent. I get a lot of emails from uh, the Daily Texan, which is the paper that I work for. So that was like a month ago. Okay, that's close enough. <laughs> that's close enough. <laughs> I love that answer. That's the first time I've ever heard <laughs> But wait a minute, friends. It's been 14 years since she began her experience there. Why in the world are they still trying to find her? Why are they still sending her emails? Now, when is the last time in a given church, and I'm not talking about the weekly offering. I'm not talking this mass market appeal to everybody sitting in the auditorium. When is the last time that we've reached out to our church members who we see every couple of weeks? When's the last time we had an opportunity for giving that was as personalized and as compelling as what that fine university is trying to do with her, except she's happy. Okay? Yeah. Most people will tell you they hear from them, their alma mater at least every six weeks. Most people will tell you the church asks for money once per year. So we have the closest of relationships because of the frequency of worship attendance, and yet we ask far, far less than a school that hasn't had her as a <coughs> student in probably 10 years now. Graduated in 13, is that about right? Okay. Am I the only one that finds this math to be kind of weird? <laughs> so when we think about where the money goes, it is not surprising that education is way up the list. They are good at asking for money. Um, I'm going to call it somebody else because I'm suspecting you're not going to read what I'm going to ask. Um, where'd you go to school? St. Andrews Presbyterian. <laughs> yes! Ah! <laughs> Lardenburg, North Carolina. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> Paul Baldessar, former president, just joined our board. Oh. Okay. So when you get mail, because they probably know where you are. See, Presbyterians, <laughs> we know where they are. <laughs> When you get a piece of mail from St. Andrews, is there, is there a colorful schematic 
of people that look like you and look like me? Yeah. There is? Yeah. You mean like a picture? The cover. The cover. Yeah. Is it people like you and people like yeah, me? The younger kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's younger kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're always good looking kids. And no, the, the, I've never been on the cover. Never will be. The college, whether it's St. Andrews or any number of Texas institutions, they're going to remind you of a happy period in your life. They're going to remind you of when we were young and thought we were beautiful and having a great time. But now think about your church collaterals. Your church collaterals are a whole lot more likely to have a picture of people who don't look like they're having as much fun. <laughs> or maybe, and, and we'll get to this in a maybe, in a minute, maybe the picture is of a church building, usually with an empty parking lot, because for some reason that's the way photographers like to do it. So as we think about how we communicate what we are communicating, we need to think about the image that we are creating. Planning, organization, and yes, even choreography are essential in the asking for money. We can't stumble over ourselves. We have to plan, we have to organize, we have to look at calendars. I live 45 minutes from Clemson University. At Westminster Presbyterian Church, when we start working on our stewardship calendar, the first thing we look at is the Clemson Home Football <laughs> Schedule. Yep. Why? Because whether people are going to be there, particularly for the early service, depends on whether Clemson's playing at home. Now, some of you have similar situations. Right. Some, and and, and the, the pro ball is a little bit more complicated because then you have to make sure you get out in time. But we, we think about the communities in which we live. We think about how we plan, how we organize, and yes, how we choreograph. How involved should the pastor be? Alan did a great job of talking about that. The pastor has to take the lead. The pastor has to be the visible champion. Sure, have, have an elder deacon, whatever term you use in your tradition, have a lay leader that's also visible, but the pastor cannot be invisible. Most of you clergy types underestimate how much influence you have in your congregations. As an eighth generation Presbyterian, I can tell you it is very hard for me to say no to my pastor. And I am not alone. You have more influence than you think. Use it. Use it wisely. But use it. So, next slide. Who are your audiences? Plural intended. Who are your audiences? Do you have just one audience when we're talking about church giving? Nay, nay. You have multiple audiences. The obvious ones are those who don't give, those who do give, those who give generously. But beware, it's, it's more subtle than that, it's more complex than that. It is a complicated image that we are working on. Age, gender, background, tenure in the church. That's one of the big things churches are beginning to study because there seems to be a pattern of the first four years of a new member's relationship with your church, they give more generously than they do in years five through 10. Huh. And then it picks back up. Now this data is still early and tentative, but there is this thing about how long somebody's been in a church and how connected they feel, how connected they, they are for that matter. We, we also need to look at the community, the worshiping community, but the community in which people live. And I love to say, I love Utah. I wish all our churches were in Utah. <laughs> because when I'm working with a Presbyterian church and they wanna, 
They want to know how to increase giving. I said, oh, this is simple. Just tell your members to give like their neighbors give. Utah is the most generous state in the country. Per capita giving in Utah as a percentage of income is four times the national average. Anybody want to guess why? The Mormons. The LDS are not hesitant to talk about money. And they're good at it. I've got a bunch of LDS friends. They view giving as an essential element of their faith experience. Okay, so you're probably not going to recruit a bunch of whole, a whole lot of LDS people to join your church. That's probably not going to happen. But here's what you can do. So just for chuckles, I pulled two zip codes of your churches. Okay, not to say that if you're in three seven two one five, that all of your members are in three seven two one five. But this is an exercise we do at the Presbyterian Foundation. So I picked two zip codes, kind of at random. One was 37215. Y'all know where that is. I don't. And the other is 37207. And again, y'all know where that is. I don't. So here's what we do. We pull internal revenue service data. Okay, I'm way down in the weeds. Just bear with me for a second. We pull IRS data. We look at incidents of charitable giving based on people's income tax returns. Now, we're not looking at Adrian's return, but we're looking at the aggregate of the people who live where she lives. And we look at income, and we look at giving. So 37215 is obviously a really prosperous area because her tax return giving is $240,000. That's high. That's really high. 37207 is a more modest neighborhood with tax return per return family income of about $36,000. If you're serving a community in that second zip code, you are going to need to have more realistic expectations of what member giving could be than if you were in 37215, right? Yeah. More prosperous membership. But then let's take it a step further. Then we look at giving as a percentage of income. So in 37215, giving is higher than it is in 37207. But on a percentage basis, in 37215, the average giving is 4% of income. That's still a lot better than the national average, but friends, those of us in the Southeast give more generously than most of the rest of the country, except for Utah, of course. So where is the generosity the strongest? The Southeast and Utah. Where is it the weakest? Pacific Northwest and New England. If you're in New England, you're gonna have more trouble raising money for your church than if you live in Tennessee. So in 37215, that average tax return has 4% of total income going to giving. All right, you with me? Mm -hmm. In 37,207, that number is almost 8%. Mm -hmm. wow. And even in a more modest demographic, the average gift in 37,207 is over $5,000. How many of you have a significant percentage of your families giving more than $5,000 to your church. Anybody? But they're giving. They're just not giving to, to us. They are giving, but they're giving somewhere else. Maybe it's to an educational institution. Maybe it's to the hospital. Maybe it's to save the whales or save the chickens or whatever it is that they care about. I have never worked with a church yet that overestimated community income, ever. Day before yesterday, I was on a Zoom call with a church in Pennsylvania, and I said, what do you think the average income is in your community? And they said $21,000. It was actually $89,000. <laughs> Friends, you have to know the community makeup. Wow. 
you have to know who's in the community, what the data is, so that you can then set some, some realistic expectations. We talked a little bit about generational theory. My father was a college professor. I'm a finance guy. My son is an engineer. Three generations, same last name. We give totally differently. I'm a baby boomer. All that stuff Alan was talking about, about being possessed by your possessions, oh, that's, that's, our, that's my generation. Okay? My father's generation, he grew up during the Depression, Presbyterian preachers here. He was one of those people that kept every envelope it's perfectly good. That's perfectly good note paper. <laughs> he wasn't a hoarder, but let me tell you, we were recycling in my family long before it was popular. <laughs> Dad died at the age of 97. About two months before he died, his best friend died. And he was in an assisted living facility, and the staff called him. They said, Mr. Greer, Dr. Greer and Ms. Phillips were so close. We, we really think you need to come down and be the one to tell them that Ms. Phillips has gone on to claim her reward. And I was in town. I jumped in the car. It hit, it hit down hard. He said, well, you know, when you're 97, you realize you don't live forever. That's profound. <laughs> He said, you know, it's the same conversation. Maybe we need to take care of some things. Oh, we had gone through all the estate planning stuff. He said, maybe we should take care of some things. Make sure that my tithe is prepaid to my church. In 10 years of handling my father's finances, he only asked two questions. Now, he asked them repeatedly, but he asked two questions. <laughs> Do I have any money left? <laughs> and am I caught up on my tithe? Mm. I hope one day I can become the kind of guy my father was. My son reacts differently than the way I react. My father reacts differently than the way either one of us. You've got to think about, and you've got to cast this image for different generations. Nick and I, contrary to how it might look, Nick and I are not the same age. <laughs> what resonates with him may or may not resonate with me. Generational theory is important. Donors versus non-donors. So this is the illustration I always use. It is not going to work in this room because we got more. Oh, okay, look at these lights. Look at these lights. Those are incandescent. The lights can be on and the lights can be off. The lights that are off, well, those are your non-donors. And then you flip a switch and the lights are on. But maybe there's a dimmer switch somewhere. The lights might be on very, very faintly, kind of like in your dining room. You know, almost everybody in their kitchen has off on. But in the dining room, you know, you've got to have ambiance. So it can be bright or it can be dim. Well, these lights represent your donors. And if they are on bright, those are your most generous donors. And if they're on dim, maybe they are nominal donors. But friends, it's a lot easier to make the lights brighter than to take a light that's off and turn it on. So your, your messaging to your non-donors is going to have to be more powerful, dare I say more aggressive, than the messaging to your donors who you hope to inspire to step up to their giving. And it's two totally different strategies. For the non-donors, what most churches do is it's a participation model. We want Ms. Smith to participate in giving, to begin to join the rest of us in giving. But Mr. Johnson is already giving. Maybe he's giving $100 a month. We want to inspire him to give more generously. And that's when we start talking about we, we call them giving equivalents. 
how much does Mr. Johnson spend at Starbucks versus how much he gives to the church? How much does Mr. Johnson spend to play around with golf compared to how much he gives to the church? How much is Mr. Johnson's car payment compared to how much he gives to the church each month? Two totally different strategies. Levels of engagement tend to predict levels of giving. If Mr. Johnson is one of your most generous donors, assuming that he's not 98 years old, you probably see him a lot. And that is a terrible example because Mr. Johnson is unlikely to be one of your most generous donors. It is much more likely to be Mrs. Smith. Women give differently, they give more generously, they show up for worship more often for two reasons. Number one, women outlive men. That's just an actuarial fact. Number two, according to Bank of America, women control 78% of personal wealth in America. It's 100% at my house, that's a totally different story. <laughs> so at the foundation, if I find out I'm going to talk to a group of guys, I'm not in a big hurry. <laughs> You give me 10 women versus 100 men, I'm talking to the women every time. <laughs> women also think about giving differently. Men tend to think about how they will give. Mr. Johnson's sitting there saying, am I gonna do this electronically? Or am I gonna write a check? Or am I gonna throw cash in the basket? Whereas Ms. Smith is thinking, here is how the cause of Christ is expanded through my giving. Women think about what they want to accomplish. Men tend to think about how they're going to do it. Totally different messaging, again. And, and since I know you're dying to know, what effect does COVID and digital worship have on all this? We don't know. We don't know yet. In time, we will know. And then that message, seg message segmentation is what we've been talking about. Different messaging for different audiences. Obviously, that's easier in a bigger church than it is in a smaller church, but it's altogether possible in a smaller church. So there are three questions. What do we want them to know? We define who our various audiences are. What do we want them to know? What do we want them to feel? What do we want them to do? So let's talk about knowledge for a minute. If you ever find yourself standing up in the pulpit saying, we have got to pledge a budget, slap yourself. <laughs> if you have to refer to it, call it the ministry plan. Mm -hmm. Even financial people don't want to hear about budgets because as soon as you talk about budgets, I'm sitting there thinking, man, who doesn't know how to do a budget? He went to seminary. <laughs> you talk about a ministry plan, and a ministry plan is, in essence, a photo gallery of what you aspire to do in the coming year. Which is going to sound better to a donor or a potential donor? A budget or a ministry plan? Ministry plan. Don't talk about budgets. Budgets are boring. I'm a finance guy. I think budgets are boring. <laughs> How do your audiences receive the information that you're pushing out? So we're going to go through a little exercise. We've established that people hear, people feel, people see. Many experts will tell you that the visual is the most important of the three. And that's why a lot of particularly large churches will have visuals on the church website and throughout the church campus reinforcing the stewardship theme. Maybe it's banners, maybe it's photographs, maybe it's the newsletter. But, but let's just, let's play a little exercise here. We're going to look at four photographs, and each of those four photographs includes new information. Photograph number one. What do we know from this photograph? This is, by the way, my daughter. She's having a great time. She is at the beach. 
She's having a great time. She, this is recreation. She's hydrating. Of all the college kids have to have a bottle. At least I hope it's water. I really hope it's water in there. So that's what we know. Recreation at the beach. She's gorgeous because she looks like her dad, and she's hydrating. Those are the elements of information. Okay. Number two. What have we just learned about Paul's daughter? Sporty. Athlete. She's sporty. Athlete. She's an athlete. You can't really tell. That says Presbyterian. Oh. Now, that is not a statement of faith. That is the name of an educational institution in South Carolina, smallest D1 school in the country. We got killed by Baylor two weeks ago. Yes. Do y'all do that number? Or is that, that's a trademark. Oh, y'all do that number? Okay. All right. So she's an athlete. What else, what else do we know? She's tall. Aha. Uh yes. -huh. I was waiting for that. No friends. She's not tall. She's five foot four. Oh, she's she's probably better. Better. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is very exactly the She is not tall, but she has long, long legs. legs. This was on purpose. We draw a conclusion based on the data that we see. Yeah. But sometimes that's incorrect. Yeah. So how many of you saw that picture and thought she's a volleyball player? Oh, yeah, I mean, wrong. Oh, so Acrobatics. Oh. She's 5'4", and she can jump backwards standing still. I'm not a tall guy, you know? Y'all didn't notice that. Okay, so there's new information. There's also information that we can make incorrect assumptions on. Number three, what have we learned? Those are two books. That is a name tag that you can't really see that says Ms. Greer. She's a teacher. She's a teacher. But wait a minute. She's on a college acrobatics team, so she's a children's teacher. So oh, elementary. Elementary. She's a student teacher. She's a student teacher for elementary school because most high school kids don't read about Clifford. They've already read They've read Okay. They've read the big read. So, see? I'm happy with that. <laughs> so we have gathered new information. She's a student teacher, and she's not in middle school or high school, early childhood education. Okay? Fourth photograph. Greg, get ready to graduate. She's getting ready to graduate. She's a senior. She graduates nine weeks from today. Oh, no. Yeah. Now she looks short in that one because she's cropped her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She looks excited. Oh, she's, oh, Lord, she's excited. Does she know she's in this presentation? No, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> you should tell this It used to be my son, and he kept complaining, and so mm -hmm. now it's my daughter. <laughs> what would happen if we gave you one photograph with all of the bits of information? Would you have absorbed all of it? No. no. Probably not. Four photographs different pieces of information, and this is called information sequencing. We tell you a story, then we tell you a little bit more, then we tell you a little bit more, then we tell you a little bit more. That goes to that intentional redundancy. Friends, you cannot give a congregation one message, one time, and expect them to do anything about it. So what we do, this is through the lens, get it, get it of photography, we share information in sequence so that you build a level of understanding and you build a level of inspiration. So what do you want your people to know? You want them to know what the plan is for the coming year and you give them the plan piece by piece by piece. The beach, D1 athlete, student teacher, soon to be graduate. Sequencing and separating the messages so that one builds upon the next. You also want them to know what role they play. Now that would seem to be obvious, right? Well, it's obvious to us because we're the ones asking. How many of you have had a conversation with somebody in your church 
you hang up the telephone or you walk away and someone, Nick says to you, so what y'all talk about? And you say, I don't know. <laughs> well, but the pastor talked to you for 10 minutes. What did he want? I don't know. <laughs> That's more common than we think it is. You have to tell people, here's what we want you to do. It's called the call to action. I mean, come on, got a bunch of baths in there. Y'all invented the altar call. <laughs> and it works. But you tell people what you want them to do. So whether it's making a public profession of faith or whether it's filling out a pledge card, tell them what you want them to do. Don't worry about insulting their intelligence. That, that's just really not a concern. What do you want them to do? What do you want them to feel? What you don't want, that didn't work. Oh, good. Didn't it? What you don't want is for them to have information without emotion to go along with it. Giving is a completely counterintuitive act. It is completely illogical. Why would I give away my hard-earned money? That is not logical, unless, unless I'm a member of a faith community, unless I view giving as a response to God's grace, unless I feel compelled to care for the least of these, unless I believe that the proclamation of the gospel is of critical importance but takes resources to accomplish then giving is not only logical, it's a moral imperative. And we have to remind our members of this. This is not just up here. This is also in here. One of the things that I discovered in these PowerPoints was I get better reaction when I show pictures of my daughter than pictures of my son. Okay, she's a lot better looking than him, I'll grant you that. But what, what I have learned is audiences, even of church people, respond better to one type of image than another. And so what you want to think about is what do your folks respond to and how can you get them to feel involved in the church and feel compelled to participate in what is truly the joy of giving. One of my mentors told me once, if you are in church and you find yourself laughing once and crying once, you have just identified the characteristics of a generous donor because you were able to speak to them at an intellectual level as well as an emotional level. And yes, I get the irony that it's the Presbyterian that's saying this because we are, in fact, the frozen chosen. <laughs> you've got to get people to know things. You've got to get people to feel things. As we think about the, the power points of images, it takes us back to photography. Yeah, I'm a photography buff. Y'all figured that out. This is what you do not want people to feel. This is what the chair of your stewardship committee feels. Are we finished yet? But let's talk about the image. So if you look at a photograph, research shows that your initial focus is top left, then bottom left, then top right, then bottom right. Good photographs are divided by thirds. And the middle third is usually the last thing that people focus on. Those of you that went to seminary know about the strong opening and the strong closing, right? And then you worry about that, you know, 16 minutes in the middle. Well, the same thing holds when you're crafting an image of stewardship. The top of the screen and the bottom of the screen have to be really, really powerful. The beginning of the message and the end of the message 
have to be really, really powerful. If you are compelled to say boring stuff, put it in the middle. Because that's where people are paying the least amount of attention anyway. So, so as we talk about focal points, we also talk about how people are going to feel, what we're going to tell them, and what do we ask them to aim for. And that's where the biblical tithe comes in. Churches that teach tithing have higher giving than churches that don't teach tithing. I always thought it was because people were aiming for 10%. The research actually shows you just get them to aim for something. Even if they never hit 10%, have them aim for something. And so, as we craft this image of how people are going to feel, this is a lovely church building, right? Classic 1950s architecture, flat, tall windows, probably stained glass, hard to tell, big steeple, cross on top. But does, it get this, does that give us the warm fuzzies? It's a church, but there's no people. This is church. <laughs> <laughs> what about instead a visual like this? Mm -hmm. A church filled with people. That's good. It's Christmas time. Trees. That's nice. But you know what the most powerful visual in this picture is? There are two. And remember, top third, bottom third. The kids are in the bottom third. The cross is in the top third. We remind people of their faith, and we remind the people that this is the future of the church. All these people down here, that's the present of the church. That is the future of the church. When I used to do a whole lot of congregational stewardship talks in worship, I had a rule. The children's choir has to sing immediately before I get up. For two reasons. Number one, they're going to feel all warm and fuzzy. Number two, they and their grandparents are going to show up. How many of you in your stewardship Sundays have the children up front singing? Do it. People will show up. People will be excited about the fact that here are a bunch of little kids who are probably singing off key, but they're the future. And they're learning about Jesus, they're learning about faith, and they're learning it in a, a caring and compassionate environment. And let me tell you, that matters. What do we want people to know? What do we want people to feel? We want them to realize that they're an essential part, even if they're only giving $50 a year, they're an essential part of this worshiping community. We want to speak to them in ways that are general, generationally relevant. We want to speak to them in ways that make them want to participate. We want them to be inspired. Question. You, sir. No, 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 no. I, I can't I can't that far, sorry. What inspires people in your church? Music. Music. How many of you pay careful attention to the music that is played on Stewardship Sunday or on Commitment Sunday? Hmm. Oh friends. <laughs> friends, 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 friends. Don't play Amazing Grace on Commitment Sunday. The words are great, but the tune's kind of a downer. You want brassy, you want joyous, you want lots of major chords, you want something that, if, admittedly, everybody knows the words, even Presbyterians know the words to Amazing Grace. <laughs> you want something that people will sing and sing loudly on Commitment Sunday. We've talked about what they know, we've talked about what they see, what they hear is not limited to the past years. Music is a powerful, this was not a setup, but I'm really glad he said what he said. <laughs> Music is a powerful motivator. 
So when we think about what inspires folks, ma'am in the blue, what inspires people in your congregation? The um, praise, dancing, and singing. Oh, the praise, dancing, and singing. So you're hearing and seeing all at the same time. Presbyterians don't dance. We don't know how to dance. <laughs> but if that is what motivates the folks in your church, then figure out if it's appropriate and possible to incorporate this into your messaging. Friends, going to church is not a spectator sport. We are participants. Come on. Clergy, y'all are either the quarterbacks or the coach. I'm not sure which. But we've got to be participants. We've got to know, but we've got to feel. What do we want them to do? You've given them the information. You've inspired them. They are jazzed up. They are excited. Unless they're just a And then you ask them what you want them to do. Do not make assumptions. Don't expect that they know what you want them to do. Four years ago, had a guy come up to me after Stewardship Sunday, after Commitment Sunday. He had filled out his pledge card. He said, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm. You know, during the service when there was all this really, really cool music, everybody was walking forward. <laughs> And there were the baskets on the floor. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> what I said was, I would be happy to take that pledge card so that the church office can re record your estimate of giving for the coming year. He said, oh, okay, great. Maybe I'll tell people what they're supposed to do with it. <laughs> Thought it was pretty obvious. But then I realized, our pastor, God love him, spent more time telling people to come up the center aisle and back to the pews on the side <laughs> aisle than he did say, and, and bring your pledge card with you. So don't make assumptions. Tell people what you want them to do. If you also offer online pledging, tell them that. Tell them how they get to that. Tell them where it is on the church's website. Tell them what to do. Tell them when to do it. Tell them how to do it. Reinforce that over and over and over again. And until you yourself are sick of hearing yourself say it, it probably hasn't been said enough. Mm -hmm. Giving the options and consider the experience. So did you notice how I talked about the baskets <coughs> that were on the floor in front of the church? Talked about what? The baskets that are on the floor in front of the church. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why the baskets are on a pedestal on the floor. Mm -hmm. See, it used to be we would walk up to the platform and the baskets were on the platform. Until Evelyn Ott, true story, Evelyn Ott is 101 years old. And four years ago, Mrs. Ott, who lives across the street from me, Mrs. Ott goes tottering forward with her envelope and she missed that first step. Mm -hmm. And she falls backwards. We have a lot of doctors and nurses in our church. She was immediately surrounded by allergists and anesthesiologists and OBGYNs. Well, I was the chair of stewardship, and she knows me. I live across the street from her. Evelyn, I, I'm not going to do this as a visual because I would not be able to get back up, but she is lying there holding her pledge card like this. <laughs> True story. So I wiggle in between Roger Gower and Randy Blewin. I wiggle between Ms. Ott, it's Paul across the street. You okay? Uh huh. Ms. Ott, would you like me to take your pledge card? <laughs> Roger Gower, who was an OB, obstetrician. <laughs> really? <laughs> I turned to him. She's 97 years old. She does not need an obstetrician at this moment. <laughs> I take the pledge card. <laughs> and Ms. Ott looks up. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad somebody's helping me. Oh! <laughs> that is when I turned to Randy Fluin, who is. Uh, I think he's 
like an epidemiologist or something like that. He's one of those doctors that nobody knows what they do. And I said, do you think we could let the nurses in since they know what to do? <laughs> True story. And the next year, the Mrs. Ott rule was imposed. Yeah. <laughs> the baskets are now at the floor. <laughs> You'd think we could have figured this out before a 97-year-old breaks her hip. Oh, wow. She broke her hip. Oh, we live across the street. Susan works at the local hospital. She goes to check on Ms. Ott. Ms. Ott said, tell Paul thank you for taking my pledge card because that's what I was trying to accomplish. Oh, wow. Now that's sweet. That's sweet. Tell them what you want them to do. Tell them when to do it. Tell them how to do it. And consider their experience. Don't make it hard. Don't make them walk up steps if they're 97 years old. It's kind of a silly story, but it brings home the point that sometimes we are so focused on the big picture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're so focused on what Alan talked about that we forget about the practical aspects of everyday life for our folks. Mm -hmm. Consider the experience. Make sure you send an acknowledgement when you get a pledge. Send an acknowledgement when you get an unexpected, generous gift. And I don't mean a computer-generated thing. I mean Bill Owens, as the pastor, handwrites in that chicken scratch handwriting of his, Dear Ms. Ott, thank you so much for your recent gift. I have no idea what his handwriting looks like. I've never seen his handwriting. I've seen him type on a computer screen. That is not what Ms. Ott wants to hear. How many of you send handwritten notes to your folks? Good for you, good for you, good for you. People, even if you can't read what it says, people appreciate that. Okay, we're on the home stretch. Consider the user experience and recognize you are not the only one that's asking. You might be the only one asking in this way. The college is asking, the Humane Society is asking, the seminary is asking. Everybody, there are two million charities in the United States not counting churches. Every one of them has your address. They've got your address. You can hide from your university. <laughs> Consider the competitive landscape. Consider the appeals that you get and which of those appeals are the most compelling. Okay. And this is the boring stuff, and we're just going to skim right through it. What do you want them to know? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? And then how do you keep score? You'll see this in your handouts. Snapshot reporting are great tools for churches to use. There are a lot of things you want to measure. We would encourage you to take a look. I'm just going to focus on two real quickly. Look at how reliant you are on your five biggest donors. Are your five biggest donors paying half of all the bills? If they are, then they are never allowed to get mad at the pastor because of a bad sermon. They are never allowed to move to Florida. Oh, and by the way, they can never die. <laughs> because you can't afford life without them. That's number one. Number two is your reliance on your oldest donors. People my son's age are not going to start giving just because people my dad's age die. Mm -hmm. Giving tends to be constant in the absence of some type of intervention. So if you are overly reliant on your very oldest donors, you need to start working for how you replace their gift. Take a look at this in your, in your spare time. And then finally, Matt told me to talk about this, but it's not nearly as exciting. There are other sources of revenue. Occupancy related, maybe you rent space in your church. Fee for service, maybe you have a preschool or adult daycare or something like that. Investment earnings. You want to pay attention to these. 
But notice this is one slide and everything else was 24 slides. That's intentional. The vast majority of your efforts should be directed at inspiring the generosity of your members. And frankly, you can't have a good stewardship program without the pastor's involvement. These things can happen without the pastor having to spend too much time on it. Your finance committee, your facilities committee, they can take care of this stuff. They cannot do stewardship alone. It is not possible. I hope these have been some helpful hints on an image of what inspired giving might look like. I have gone over, no big surprise there, but I think we still got a little bit of time for we Q&A. We do. So, what does inspired giving look like in your church? You, ma'am, I bet you're United Methodist. I love the church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. um, what does it look like in your church? What does it look like? I have a question. That's why. I'm oh, okay. Okay, okay. Um, you talked about the you know, and I'll get you to answer you also. Geographical differences in giving. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that there are also differences denominationally and also racially? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, people of color tend to give at a higher percentage than Anglo's. Asians tend to give at a higher level still. Um, and, and I think part of that is the experience. I think with Asians, it's more cultural than it is experiential. In our African American church, I mean, if I could get away with it, every one of these talks would just be videos from African American churches and the way they talk about giving. And, and, and so much of that is that experience that the member has. Um, Racial, and then what was the other? The, the first denomination. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the Presbyterians are pretty much at the bottom of the pile. I mean, I'm sorry, but we are. And remember, there are a couple dozen different Presbyterian denominations. So the PCUSA is the biggest. The PCA, Presbyterian Church of America, is the next biggest. Their giving per member is more than twice what ours are. Now, why is that? One simple reason, according to their people, they talk about tithing, we rarely do. Um, there are differences in variation, and, and differences and variations based on denomination. It does not tie to relative wealth. So who are the wealthiest Protestants in the United States? Anybody want to guess? Episcopalians. They don't have the highest level of giving. If you look at the Pentecostals, they are not the wealthiest. They are among the most generous because they will talk about some money. Are there things we can learn from one another? Absolutely. I learn more stuff from the Baptist at the Center for Healthy Churches because I have come to the conclusion that the Baptists probably have the healthiest balance of the denominations of being attractional to visitors, to being able to retain members, to being able to engage members. Presbyterians don't tend to be strong at those. The other thing that you didn't ask that I will volunteer is you also see a significant difference in the way stewardship is handled in small churches as opposed to large churches. Large churches talk about them. They just do. Small churches tend to be much more secretive. I don't mean just confidential. I mean secretive. Whereas in large churches, it tends to be a more open conversation. So let's talk about your congregation. What inspires people, or, or what does that look like in your own congregation? The inspiration, I would also say, is children, music, dancers. But in our congregation also, there's a healthy um, appreciation for our seniors. Good. We have 96, several, you know, 90s, hundreds, and whenever we could get them to participate in the service, I mean, it is just, just fires everybody. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Others. 
What does inspiration look like? What does an image of inspired giving look like in your church? Paul, oh, when I was at Woodmont, and Woodmont was a, a good church, strong church, there 17 years. Um, it was interesting, though, in terms of special giving, whether it's for missions project or for um, something else, visuals were so important. We went back to the old-fashioned thermometer mm -hmm. and would fill in every week where we were doing And more people responded to that than if you put updates in the board because of the visual. They looked at that. Y'all remember the thermometer that the United I think we still use it. Yeah, it works. It's, it's powerful. It works. It shows, it, it's this visual cue that shows where you're trying to go and how close you are to the destination. Yes, sir. You're, what you were talking about, about photography and, and, and uh, sequencing of events reminds me a lot. It's not for the church as much as it occurs in our church. I'm one of the founders of a nonprofit, one of the co founders of a nonprofit here in Nashville called The Contributor, where, where um, uh, street paper is sold by homeless people around town. And um, in my trainings for years, I used imagination exercises, um, which I stole from Lamaze classes. Um, uh, um, uh, but the idea of imagining yourself in labor and, and preparing you, um, to, you know, and, or whatnot, and and so the idea of of you know them imagining themselves, and my goal was to spread them out around the city. So um, it was imagining them on a bus um, and and coming in and buying their papers because yeah, they have to, we take money from homeless people. Right. Uh, and, 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 and we get the papers and they go and sell them. Um, and so imagine some buying papers and, go, and, and then they're going out and getting the bus again and going out to the spot that they, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so it, but just programming them mm -hmm. with it. And, you know, it, just, it, just, it, it seemed like that was the exact same thing as your sequencing. Right. Um, uh, but I don't know if that's, if there's a way to use that. And, uh, it, 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 you know, pastor probably could. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but close your eyes and imagine with me is sort of the way it went. But that's just something that just dawned on me. And if you think through, regardless of what you call it, if you think through, if you imagine, if you think through the sequencing, you are much more likely to identify obstacles than if you just assume, oh, everybody knows how to do this. And, and pushing the obstacles out of the way to make the experience positive, to make the experience seamless, and increasingly, to make the experience quick. I personally don't have a problem spending a bunch of time thinking about how much money I want to give to my church. But what folks are finding, you, you see online pledging, online giving, it's quick, it's convenient. And during COVID, oh my gosh, at the Presbyterian Foundation, our electronic gifts used to produce about one page of gifts per week. Everybody on senior staff gets this report. Two months into COVID, that report was 500 pages long. Wow. That's crazy. Because it was convenient, yeah. and if the church doors are closed, yeah. how, are you, how are you going to easily receive your, your folks' giving? Other other images of what inspired giving looks like. Come on, Andrew. Come on. Um, thinking about the ways that sharing an impact outside of what's happening. You know, most people only ever see what happens from eleven to noon on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So sharing stories of here's something that's happening in one of the nonprofits that uses our space. Here's what's happening in our Saturday night community program. Um, is a way to help people see that, you know, of course you have to keep the lights on, but no one has ever like salivated over paying a electric bill. Not yet. <laughs> not, not yet. But you can get people excited about, you know, our homeless ministry has seen consistently, you know, several dozen people coming every week, and, and here's the conversations that we're having with folks as they come through the door. Um, that can be really amazing as well. Correct. One byproduct of COVID is we have heard from some of our churches that moved to outdoor worship when weather permitted. That's it. You know, we learned a lot of things about the neighborhood. Because we were sitting outdoors in the neighborhood for an hour every Sunday. 
Whereas typically we drive our car into the parking lot and we walk in the door, and I mean, I've heard that multiple times. Other thoughts, observations? Actually, it's funny that you just said that because um, one of the things that our pastor do is he would cast a vision mm -hmm. and he would provide, um, give photos of say like our parking lot. You know, we're, we have a parking lot um, campaign going on. And so to see what the parking lot looks like and then he cast a vision that we will actually have a service on our new parking lot. You know, oh. everybody's excited about it. And so that is one of the, the things that he a church that I know during COVID did a small capital campaign to refurbish the worship space. The worship space was the parking lot. And when I talked to the pastor, he said, well, I was thinking about the sex appeal of saying, help us fit the pot, fix the potholes versus help us improve our worship space. And they, they pledged it up just like that. That's good. Great. Anyone else as we're wrapping up? Paul, well, sometimes <clears throat> if you give an inspiring challenge, uh, don't discount what laity in the church will add to the table. We had a, um, a Christmas offering one year. We were trying to raise $10,000. And one of our older deacons got up with tears in his eyes. He said, we're better than this. And he took a marker. He had a sharp in his hand. And he added a zero. Mm, wow. So we went, our goal went from 10 to 100. Wow. We made it. Did you know he was going to do that? No. Walked up a big wow. fat sharp and said, we're better than this. We can do better than this. He said, I can give 10 myself. And he wrote a, wrote a circle. On it. And did you notice that he had tears in his eyes? Yep. Yeah. He knew, yeah. but he also felt. Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of guy I want in my church. Yeah. 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 So, Paul, when I was a, uh, a student at Belmont and actually went to Sunday night church. It's been that long ago. Wow. So went to the Hatton Church 35 years ago in Nashville on a Sunday night. And um, sitting in the back of this church, and there was a young dad and probably a four-year-old daughter. And she had turned around, stayed for the service for preaching, turned around on her knees, coloring in the pew. And they would, would receive their offering at the end of the service. And so when the plates are being passed and came to them, she had a purse. And he said, how much, honey? And she pushed her hair back like a little girl will. And she said, all of it, Daddy. And oh, wow. did that. And so that is just like the story that John told that from a little girl <laughs> that is forever imprinted in my mind of, of giving I'm confident that it was just change, but still in the eyes of God, I believe it was, yes. it was all of it. Yeah, that's right. So one last question, one last challenge. Clergy people, raise your hands, please. How many of you, when the offering comes up to the front after it is taken, how many of you walk down, reach in your pocket, and put your envelope in the plate. Think about the visual effect of your own participation as the leader of the congregation. If your parishioners see you, it doesn't have to be at the end, it can be at the beginning, but if they see you coming down and putting your envelope in, that is a powerful motivator. In my church, the chair of the stewardship committee is strategically positioned to be the first person to walk to the basket. Then the other, the, the pastoral staff comes down. And then the pastor says something along the lines of, now that you have seen that your leaders have made their commitment to the ministry plan to Westminster Presbyterian Church for 2023. Now and only now is it appropriate that we invite you to join us. First year we did that, pledging increase 17%. It's a powerful visual when folks see their leaders doing the same thing that they're asking you to do. Friends, 
Thank you. It's been a pleasure being with you. I think